Um, so I don't know if you've noticed, um, Brian is, Pastor Brian is not here today, um, but that is very intentional. Um, we actually had a conversation, um, Brian, Jake, and myself in Arby's not too long ago, um, about a month or two ago, um, and we, we said we really need something during this pandemic, and, we, and we've, we've known that um, Cornerstone has helped so many and has had sessions with us on helping, and so we're, we're doing a session today on hope and resilience, and Carrie Taylor is coming, and she's the director of Cornerstone of Hope, and so it's really great. She said yes right away to be able to come, and so it's, we're privileged to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, it's great to be with you all today. Can you hear me okay? We good? All right. Awesome. Um, and thank you. Um, I bring greetings from um, the Cornerstone staff, and we actually have one of your church members on our staff now, Kendra Bermosk. Love her. So excited to have her on our team. Yes, yeah, so we're so grateful for that. So when you get, see Kendra, give her an air hug or something, you know, tell her we appreciate her. Um, and also, thanks for praying for my church. Lima Community is where I go to church. My husband's on staff there, so that was a treat. Thank you for that. It's great to be with you all. We are so excited to get to partner with the Learning Tree and the students and the families here uh, throughout, um, really starting later this month, um, getting to equip them with a lot of skills. So thank you for inviting us. We just love partnering with you. Before we dive in today, a couple things. One, we, uh, Cornerstone of Hope has been asked by the Mental Health Board um, of the surrounding counties for us to provide these virtual workshops to our community. That is, uh, what you're seeing today is kind of a taste of that. It's more of an extended version of what you'll see this morning. And there's a handout out on the table that tells you we've got two in January and two in February coming up. And they're free for anyone. So if this is helpful to you, you want to share that with somebody, you can get information um, out there at the table. I also want to let you know, on your seat, you have something that looks like this, and it's called my Pandemic Hope and Resilience Plan. And for those of you online, hello, um, but you may not have this, and if you don't, just grab a piece of paper. That works just fine. So either way, and we will be referring to this a lot, and part of it is really I want to encourage you to actually fill this out as we go, because then you have something to refer back to when the overwhelming emotion of this time kind of hit, and then you'll know what to do with it. So it is there for you, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of connect with that at some times. So this is going to be a little bit of a different Sunday message than you're probably used to. It's a little bit more like a workshop, all right? So we're going to kind of, kind of do some um, engaging together and things. So here we go. My first question to you is how many of you have at some point during this pandemic felt off? Okay, do you all see the hands? You are not alone, right? You have felt off. Now, this is a problem because our brain does not compute that word off the way we mean it. Our brain hears off and it thinks light switch, on, off, I'm not sure. What are we talking about? Right? It doesn't know what that means. And we don't even know what that means ourselves. And so we keep saying, I just feel off or I feel bad, which aren't even emotions. Right? But we keep saying these things. And so today I want to give you a couple words that will help you identify that's what it is. That's what's going on inside of me. And I don't just want you to know what's going on, but I'm going to give you a ton of skills that believe God has equipped us with to help you manage it better. So here we go. The first word that I want to talk about is grief. Now, grief is defined as um, keen mental suffering or distress over affliction or loss. Now, how many of you feel like you've lost something during this pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. We've all lost something, right? And it doesn't just mean lost someone, but it means something. Maybe you've lost plans or um, what you had planned on happening at Christmas or vacations or the ability to connect like you wanted or something. like We've all lost something. And, and when we realize that's grief that you're feeling, when, you're, when that emotion wells up because of that, that's grief. And that's okay to acknowledge. And grief often shows up in our life like this. Instead of going in a nice, neat circle um, where we experience all the emotions of grief, of like denial and bargaining and anger and depression and acceptance, which looks like we just get through that and we're good to go, grief tends to feel more like this. 
like a whirlwind. And we kind of go through those emotions multiple times in a day. And that's kind of more the reality of what it's like. Now, the second term that I want to introduce you to today is called chronic stress. And chronic stress is defined as the response to emotional pressure suffered for a prolonged period of time in which an individual perceives they have little or no control. How many of you at some point during this pandemic feel like you have no control? Absolutely, right? We have all felt like this. And the problem with that is your brain does not handle that well. When your brain interprets a situation that, wait, I don't have any control here, it feels like you're in a constant state of threat or attack, and that does not go well for us. I want to show you, I promise I'm not going to draw the whole time, okay? I got two more illustrations, and then you don't have to see me draw anymore. But here we go. I want to show you this real quick. So there is this fantastic book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And the premise of this book is that zebras, when they're out on the savanna doing their thing, they're eating their grass, chilling out, doing their thing, enjoying the day, their, their heart rates are calm, everything's good. All of a sudden, they see or are aware of an, a lion getting ready to pounce. And what happens is their heart rate starts going up, their adrenaline starts pumping, blood starts rushing through their body, and their fight or flight response goes off to help them get to safety. Now, when that happens, so here's the, here's the stressor. This is zebra grazing here. Z, a stressor of the lion happens. Their bodies physiologically respond so that they can get to safety. Once the stressor passes, they de-escalate. They go back down to eating grass. They're good to go, right? They just eat their grass. We humans don't do this so well, right? We don't just have a stressor and we get through it and we're like, eh, let's go eat grass, right? I mean, we, we, we don't do that so much. And that's a problem. We were designed to do that. When stress is handled well, that's how it happens. We rise to meet the stressor, we deal with it, and we de-escalate. But what's happening right now during this prolonged pandemic is we have a stressor that hits us here, and instead of de-escalating, we go, oh, no, there's another one. Oh, no, that's a big one. Okay, that one's not so bad, but it's still, oh, no, here's another one. And we have gone from stressor to stressor to stressor without de-escalating in the meantime. So each one of these have not been able to de-escalate. And so we're living above this baseline. And when we live up there for a long time, that impacts us mentally and emotionally, relationally, physically, spiritually. We, we just feel it all over. And so part of what I want to teach you today is how do we de-escalate? How can we manage what we're experiencing in a really healthy way? So one more picture. You ready? Here we go. All right. If this is you, and you're at baseline here. You're calm. You're feeling confident. You're feeling good. This is, you're all right in this moment. Then your life happens, right? Then the day gets started. So here we go. Sometimes we experience it like a cliff that sounds something like this. Oh, dear. I can't find my mask. Where's the mask? I can't leave my house without the mask. Okay. I got to work. We're doing what now? This changed again? Oh, I don't even understand. What are we doing? Hey, did you see the numbers today? I can't believe that person's social media post. Did you see what they said? They don't agree with me, and I can't agree with them. This is awful. Oh, my goodness. Who got quarantined? You mean I was exposed? Now i got to change everything. i got to redo what I work. How are we going to manage this? What? We can't do that now? Are you kidding me? And we just go up and up and up right? It just escalates, escalates, escalates. It's exhausting talking about it, right? Um, We just escalate. And when we get to the top of our ability to manage the stress, it, we feel completely overwhelmed. How many of you have ever felt that? Because you're human, right? You're not a robot. So we have all felt this complete overwhelmed. And if we still don't manage it, We jump off this cliff into this negative spiral that sounds very hopeless. Like, this is hopeless. This is the worst thing ever. We're never going to get through this. It's never going to get better. I should quit my job. I should never talk to anybody because it's too disappointing when I can't say. Just, Just complete downward spiral, right? And this happens to us, but it doesn't have to. What if you recognize, what if you learn to be aware? You know what? I'm about halfway up my cliff here. I'm feeling that. And what if you had the skills to use to de-escalate yourself from those stressors so that the next one that hits you only hits you here instead of way up here? Wouldn't that be cool? If we could manage it and know how to de-escalate, know how to do this in a way that is life-giving to us. 
And that is what I hope will equip you with today. So before we do this, you're going to know a lot about your brain today than maybe you knew coming in, which is very exciting to me because I love to talk about that. But I love to talk about it because our creator is the one who designed our brain. And God has designed our brain in amazing ways to work for us, not against us. And we have to pick up the tools he's given us. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about your brain because if you don't understand how your brain works, you won't know how to make it work for you. Okay, so here we go. Here's a a little uh, depiction of the brain. So right here between your temples, that is where your amygdala is located, right? It's about this big. You got one on each side. Amygdala is simply Greek for almond-shaped. That's all it means. That's all they could come up with. Scientists were like, well, it's shaped like an almond. Let's just call it amygdala, right? That's all you got. Um, And so it's tiny. And this is the part of your brain that perceives things as a threat, It's looking around, trying to keep you safe. And so it is your fight or flight or freeze response. And it goes off if anything seems like a threat around you. And from there, it goes to your hippocampus, which is in your limbic system, which is kind of between your temples. And that part of your brain does a lot of things. But one of the things it does is it feels It feels the weight of that threat, right? It feels things. Now, this is where we tend to stop using our brain. Right? So we get triggered by something in our environment, and we feel it. And then we just react. Right? We we explode like a volcano. We shut down in a box. We go to some unhealthy coping strategy. We just react. Instead of utilizing the part of our brain that God has given us that can help us, and that's this part, the prefrontal cortex, which comes over the top, and its job is to tell you truth and reason and logic and help you with decision-making, and it, it has language, and all of those things play a role in that part. Let me show you with my hand. If my thumb is, is your amygdala, The job of the prefrontal cortex is to come over top and keep it managed, right? Keep it under control. But we don't tend to use it very well. So this is the, what I really want to help you know today is how to get your prefrontal cortex back online because we have been operating out of threats to our amygdala and we've been feeling, but we don't have words for it. And so we have not been able to use our prefrontal cortex because in our feeling part of our brain, our hippocampus, there's no language in that part of the brain. So until you start to put words to your experience and use language, you cannot engage your prefrontal cortex. How many of you have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews? Okay, have you ever used this phrase, use your words? Anybody ever use that? Use your words. Do you know what you're really saying to kids? You're saying to them, please use your prefrontal cortex because your amygdala and your hippocampus, I'm not jiving with. I don't know what's going on right now, right? We don't really say it that way, but that's what we're communicating is please use your prefrontal cortex because if you could put language to this instead of flopping on the floor or yelling, I might be able to do something about this. Now, um, for those of you who are teenagers and adults, guess what? I think it would be fantastic if we could say to each other, could you use your words, right? Could you just use your words right now? Like, can you just tell me what's going on? I think this would help marriages. I think it'd be wonderful, right, if we used our words. Kids, I give you permission to tell your parents, "Um, mom, dad, use your words, right? Use your words today. This is huge because once we use our words, we're engaging our prefrontal cortex, and we can actually do something about our situation. And there's hope in that. And that's how our creator has designed our brains to work. So what we're going to start with on your sheet, I'm going to give you just a little time, and, and some of it you might fill out as we go, but um, I'll, I'll kind of direct you to that when it's your turn to fill something in or online for you to jot this down too. So what we're going to start with is self-awareness, okay? So we live in a culture that's not good about this. We don't know what's going on in our own bodies and brains. We, we just don't pay attention to that. We just keep going from stress to stress. So we're going to give you some time this morning to say, what is actually happening in me so I can identify it? Now, what are you doing when you do this? You're using language, right? We're already engaging your prefrontal cortex as we go here. So the first question for you is, what are three losses you are grieving during this pandemic? I just want you to write them down. What are three that your you're losses that you're very aware of during this pandemic? Just go ahead and jot those down.
If you don't have a pen, you can type it in your phone or you can just think on it, all right? All right, some of you may still be writing, and I know I wish I could give you more time, but to get through everything, I'm just going to have to keep us rolling here a little bit. So the next question I have for you is, what are your top three stressors that you are experiencing right now during this pandemic? What are the three things? Man, those things keep stressing me out. Go ahead and jot those down. And if you're still writing, that's okay. Now I'm going to share with you what are some of the physical and behavioral symptoms of grief and chronic stress. Like what are some of the common things that we're seeing in people when they have this? So I'm going to read these to you. You also have them on the back of your sheet. They're listed for you back there um, if you want to follow along. And what I'd like you to do is pay attention to these and either star them or circle them or maybe um, jot them down. I think I've given you space to jot down um, three of them, uh, the symptoms you are aware that you've experienced. So here we go. Some of you may be experiencing muscle tension, stomach aches, chest pain, headaches, or jaw tightness. It's just kind of where it's, it's settling in you. Some of you may be restless or you're not able to relax, maybe like you felt like you used to be. Some of you might have difficulty concentrating or having a foggy brain. Have you, have you ever had this, like, fog brain? I, I mean, people keep telling me this recently. Like I, just, I, like, I can't even think, right? That's a common symptom of grief. And when stress is so big, we can't think. It feels like fog. Um, some of you are feeling easily fatigued, and you just don't have energy. You just feel exact of energy. Some of you might be having a sleep disturbance where you can't fall asleep, or you're waking up during the night, and you can't get up in the morning. Um, here's some more. You might feel detached or you're detaching from others. You're just kind of pulling back like it's just too much to do that. Some of you might have rapid thoughts where they just go from thing to thing to thing. Sometimes it happens at night when we're trying to rest. Uh, maybe changes in appetite where you want to eat a lot more or you're just not hungry anymore. And maybe some of you experience that. Some of you, tearfulness. I hear more and more people telling me, I just feel more tearful. And it just, like, it just comes out my eyeballs. <laughs> like the stress, just out it comes, you know. And some of us have been experiencing that more and more. Uh, maybe you're shutting down or withdrawing. And you're just kind of starting to be like, ah, I don't really want to do what I used to do. I don't really want to do anything. Um, and maybe some of you are becoming irritable or aggressive. How many of you have felt more irritable? During this time? Yeah, join the club. You know why? Because we're all living up here. And so any little extra irritation just phew, sends us right up. And, and so we're all kind of feeling a little more irritable than we're used to. So I hope you were able to write some of those down or jot some of those down that you have been experiencing during this time. But that's so important to know and identify what is happening in my body. What is going on, these symptoms of the stress or the grief or the anxiety or the depression that's going on underneath. Now, I want to move on here quick to the emotional symptoms that you're experiencing, okay? So remember, this is the use your words, okay? A little more words going on here, and then we're going to flip to some coping strategies. So I want to go over, these are some of the common emotional responses to grief and chronic stress. These are not all of them, but these are some. So denial, shock, frustration, fear, anxiety, or uncertainty, I'm sorry, anxiety, worry, anger, low mood, depression, sadness, apathy is when you just don't care. I just don't care. Um, helpless, boredom, and numb. And I've had people say, is numb a feeling? And I've explained it as numb is what happens in our bodies when you've had so much emotion that your brain's like, I, need, I just need a breather. <laughs> I'm just going to numb out for a little bit because I just can't do this right now. You still have the emotions. They're still there. But you're just, your brain's like, I need a breather. Okay? Now, what I want to tell you, we had a staff member who did a training for us, and she found a statistic that 70% of adults do not know how to express what they feel. They don't know what they're feeling. And that's really sad. Because how are we supposed to engage our prefrontal cortex when we have such a minimal um, emotional vocabulary? And how are we going to teach kids to do this well if we aren't doing this and using emotional words to explain what's going on inside. So this is a huge part uh, of, of actually coping with this. So on the back of your sheet where you have the, um, 
physical symptoms. You also have this emotion wheel. Y'all see that? Um, online, if you can't see it, it's just a wheel with a lot of emotions in it. And you could even Google one if you want to just type in emotion wheel. So in the middle are some basic emotions. And like the top here is anger. And it shoots out from there to give you some more specifics that you feel. Uh, that you might feel if you're in the anger category. So what I'd like you to do real quick is to check, it, check out that wheel. And I just want you to jot down what are your top five emotions that you have been experiencing during this pandemic. And see if you can recognize what part of your body you feel them in. So maybe if you're um, irritated, maybe you feel that in your jaw. And your jaw gets really tight. Maybe some of you who feel like you experience a lot of um, uncertainty or anxiety, maybe you feel that in your stomach. Um, so where, where do those emotions show up in your life? I'm going to give you a moment to jot those five down and where you feel them. If you're still working, that's okay. <clears throat> Keep working on it. But I'm going to take you to the beach for a second. Can y'all go there with me? All right, here we go. We're going to go to the beach for a second. So you know how the water hits the sand, and it's just that real shallow area of the beach? And if you were to wade in a little bit, um, and let's just say it's a normal kind of breezy day at the beach, all right? It's a breezy day, and so the breeze is blowing, and it kind of, the, there's those ripples in the water that you kind of stand and kind of move like this, right? Because it just kind of ripples, and you're aware that there's this happening, this movement in the water. You're aware of it. It doesn't throw you off too much. You just know it's there. Then the tide comes in. So when the tide comes in, that's coming in with some force, right? There's some energy packed behind that. And it's coming in kind of hard. And you might actually have to change your stance because you got to brace yourself because, wow, that was a big wave, right? That one hit me pretty hard. And then there are tsunamis, right? Which those just come in and it just overtakes, right? Now, I love when God speaks to us through his creation. And he does this in such profound ways. Do you realize that there is no wave, whether it's tsunami size or ripple, none of them have ever lasted forever. None of them. Waves always recede. They always go back. And what you've been experiencing through this pandemic is waves of grief, waves of stress, right? Waves of maybe depression or anxiety. And they come like that. But they were meant to recede. When they are done healthy, they come, we feel them, we acknowledge them, and we know what to do to help them recede. And this is the gift God has given us, and he's shown it to us in creation. They don't last forever. They do recede. And that's huge. I want to share with you a passage of scripture. It's on the bottom of your sheet, so you can, can read it along with me. But it's in Isaiah 43. And this is what God spoke to the prophet Isaiah. He gave him these words to share with his people. But I think he could give us the same words today, and it would still matter. So listen to these words. In Isaiah 43, 2, it says, and real quick, can you listen for the word when? Just pay attention to the word when. It says this. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Aren't you thankful God said when? If God had said if, and we were in this pandemic, I'm not sure I would trust him very much. But he said, when? He said, when you go through hard times, I will be with you. They will not overwhelm you. I will find you a way through it. He said, when? Because he knew you would deal with it. He knew we'd go through hard things. He said, when? Because he knew he had already equipped you to do hard things. How many of you have been through something hard before? And you survived? Because you're here. 
We've all been through hard things. Your creator knew you would face them, and he made you in such a way to get through hard things. You were equipped for this. And he says, when, I will give you what it takes. I will be with you. I will get you through this. Isn't that great news? This is what he says to us. And we, he is not, do you know that God's not intimidated by this pandemic? This doesn't shock him, stun him, scare him. He's not intimidated by it. And he doesn't want us to be. He says, I will get you through this. I will absolutely do this for you. He, he said, I have equipped you to do this and to do it well. And so that's the, we're now, you see their line across your paper. Now we're going to shift into what we can do about this. Because we have a God who said when, and he will get us through. So let's find out how he's going to do that. All right, one of the major things I can teach you to do during this time is to shift your thinking in one simple way. During this video, remember we talked about how you felt out of control at some point? When we focus on what we cannot control, our amygdala has a freakout moment. It goes into freak out. That's not safe. That's not safe. If I can't control something, this isn't safe. That means I'm helpless. This is not good. And so we live in this heightened state of freak out mode, right? Which is not how God designed us. So there are some things that are out of our control during this time. There absolutely are. And let's, let, I'm going to talk about those. But there are also some things that you can do. And we're going to talk about that. So real quick, some things that are out of our control. The length of the pandemic, possible exposure, pandemic protocols, political climate, store and restaurant policies, travel limitations, other people's media posts and choices. Those are not in your control. You do not have a say in those things, right? Now, if that's what you focus on, you are going to have higher stress, higher grief, higher anxiety, greater depression. You're going to live in a threat state. But if you were to make a switch in your thinking to, but what can I do? What is it that I can do? Here are some things. I can wash my hands. I can be productive. I can get work done. I can maintain a routine. I can do the very next thing. I can connect with friends and family. I can drink water, eat healthy, exercise. I can laugh with friends, family, and coworkers. I can encourage others and practice gratitude. I can adapt a constant flexibility mindset, which is how we're all living right now, right? I can do this. I can roll with this. I can be flexible. I can use healthy coping. I can wear a mask. I can take media breaks. I could talk to someone. I could use my strengths. I could go on and on and on about the things that you can do. Your creator did not leave you helpless during this time. He has given you way more that you can do than what you can't. There is always more you can do than what you can't in a situation. And that is true for us right now. So we want to make sure that we're taking our thoughts captive. Like Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, take your thoughts captive and make sure they line up with truth. Right? If you're telling yourself, I'm helpless, you're going to feel it. But it's not true. Right? If you say, I'm, I am not helpless, I am equipped to do, to get through this. What can I do? You're going to feel that confidence and begin to move. So here we go. We're going to talk about some real practical things. So the first question I have for you is what are three things you can do daily to take care of yourself physically? Now, we, many of you are wearing a mask. That's one thing, right? We can wear a mask. We can wash our hands. We can use hand sanitizer. We can socially distance. But there's some other things too. How are you sleeping? Are you getting seven to eight hours of sleep a night? Because that actually heals your brain while you're sleeping. It actually builds your immune system. Are you doing that to help yourself physically? What about water? Are you drinking water? Water helps build your immune system. Or are you just drinking all the sugary products, right? Are you eating healthy um, proteins and fruits and vegetables and healthy grains? Guys, nobody tells you what you have to eat. That You choose what you put in your mouth. Are you putting the things in that actually help your brain function through this time? Are you taking vitamins? Are you moving your body? What are the things you're doing? So what are those three things that you can do daily to take care of yourself physically? That's the first question. Now the next thing we're going to go over, as you're writing those down, we're going to talk about um, healthy coping skills. Now, these are up here, and you're going to be like, yeah, I, could, I can see those things, but I'm going to tell you how to use these. Okay? And I want to explain to you why they help. 
Because if all I did was read these to you, you'd be like, yeah, okay, whatever. But you wouldn't do them. But if I can tell you what, how, what that does in your brain, you might actually translate this into action. And these are listed on the bottom of this sheet if you need to follow along. All right? How many of you like music? Wonderful, right? Music is God's gift. It's a wonderful gift to us. Now, here's what happens. When you have a wave of emotion hit you that you're not wanting, if you turn on music, your brain has to divert attention away from that to use your sense of hearing to take in the sounds of the music. Along with that, if the music has positive messaging, that means it has words that are positive uplifting, guess what part of the brain you're using? prefrontal cortex, because that's the part that uses language, you're taking in, you're listening, you're going over the words in your head, you are engaging your prefrontal cortex. It is beginning to get back online instead of being flared up because your amygdala is talking so loudly, right? So music is a wonderful way. Laughter. Laughter is one of the most overlooked coping strategies there is. Um, how many of you have noticed um, that people are getting really serious during this time? Have you noticed that? Like, everything's heavy. Like, in Back to the Future, everything's heavy, right? And so um, th we notice this a lot. Now, I'm going to tell you a story uh, that happened in our house during this pandemic. And um, did your kids ever just say things? You're like, well, that's profound, right? I had this moment, and, and my son let me share it. So here it goes. We have guinea pigs at our house. And my oldest son, his guinea pig's name was Nugget. And Nugget was not doing so great. And we came home from a trip, and Nugget had died. And my son was broken, just broken. And he was sobbing. He was holding this little guinea pig, and we're hugging him. We're trying to just comfort him. And, and my younger son tells a story uh, that is hilarious about Nugget. And my older son, he stops crying, and he laughs. And he says, wait, wait, I, I'm laughing. That means I'm going to be okay. Isn't that profound? 15-year-old. I mean, isn't that awesome? I was like, I don't think you know what you just said. You know, now, does that mean he doesn't grieve? No, he still grieves for his guinea pig. But we laugh alongside the grief. And he said, if I can laugh and grieve, I'll be okay. Isn't that awesome? So what are you doing that causes laughter? Are you, are you watching funny things? Are you engaging in funny conversations? Are you laughing at yourself right now? You know, there's some funny things we do, you know? And so see if you can incorporate laughter into your world a little more. Because laughter, you don't feel stressed when you're, laughter, when you're laughing. You don't feel anxious. It just comes out. It's a de-escalator. Uh, connecting with others. This is a huge thing. We're going to talk about this in a second, but so a little bit more, but connecting with people, and I know that looks different now, but being intentional about connecting with somebody can help you when you're feeling escalated. Media breaks. Let's talk about this for a second. So if when you wake up in the morning, you check social media and you see all the comments and the opinions of other people, you check the, the newspaper or online, and you see, oh, dear, the numbers for today are this. And then you watch the news multiple times. You keep checking all this stuff. What's actually happening, and they've done research on this, is your, your amygdala is staying in a constant state of threat because it sees all of this bad negative news as threatening to you. So you're living with that amygdala loud in your head. And that does not engage your prefrontal cortex because your amygdala is like, we got to get safe, we got to get safe. This is awful, this is awful, this is awful, right? And so I just, I have had in my office, I've had to say to people, listen, I, I don't know if you need this, but I'm giving you permission to take a break from social media, right? If you check the numbers in the morning, you don't need to know if they got bigger by night, right? Like, I mean, that's not going to affect you that much at all. I'm not saying we should be uninformed. We need to know what's going on. But don't check it all day. If something crucial happens, someone's going to let you know, right? Like, you don't have to always be putting yourself in that state. So please, take social media breaks. Um, how many of you like games, puzzles, things like that? You enjoy Sudoku, crossword, you know, things like that. All right, that is a wonderful use. When you have those waves hitting you, to take a moment and say, you know what? All right, it's Sudoku time. <laughs> Just, and you start doing your Sudoku because what is happening then when you're doing games and puzzles, you're engaging the logical part of your thinking, which uses your prefrontal cortex, right? You're getting that back online so that you can do something that gives you that sense of logic and reason, and I can do this right now. Um, reading um, and new learning. So let's talk about this for a second. Reading is wonderful. Now, what reading involves what? 
Words, right? And what part of your brain uses words? Prefrontal cortex, right? So when you're starting to read, if it's not about the pandemic or politics, you might be engaging in some new learning, which your brain loves. Your brain is thrilled when you're learning something new. It, like the neurons are firing like crazy. It's like happy going on in there, okay? So if you're able to read something that is not pandemic related, not politics related, something that you're just learning about. For me, I love learning about the brain. I just got a new book called The Brain, which I'm loving to read. And my, my brain gets very happy when I do that. And it takes me a break from everything else. It's so cool. So when you have time to take to read um, or learn something new, that's huge. Let me tell you this too. We are doing a lot of reading about so on social media, in newspapers, about what's going on. We also have got to be reading God's word. We cannot let that get pushed aside at a time like this. We need to be reading God's word. When you read his word and engage in it, you are engaging your prefrontal cortex. That's why his word says meditate on it day and night. He knew that would be best for you because it gets the right thinking going in your head. Okay, writing and journaling. So when you write, I tell people that's like anti-anxiety medication without bad side effects, right? Because you cannot think as fast as you write. So it slows your brain down. Did you know that? It slows your brain down to get it out. And we also call it a brain dump. Like if you've got all these thoughts and emotions swirling around inside, if you will just write them out and list them out, your brain's like, thank heavens, that's out now, right? It's like a relief for your brain to just write those down. I think David did this a lot in the Psalms. He modeled this for us. He, he has, poor guy, we're reading his journal all the time, you know? And uh, I can't wait to sit down in heaven. Okay, this psalm, tell me what was happening. And I'm sure he's like, it was a bad day. Oh my goodness, I can't even tell you all what was going on. We just see his emotion. But he had that relationship with God where he used his language to get out what was going on inside. So that's huge. Gratitude and encouragement, we're going to touch on that in a second. The next three are breathing, relaxation, and movement. And those are bold on the screen because those are the three that research over time has found give you the most the quickest relief when you're feeling those waves of emotion come. So let me explain this breathing real quick, because some of you might be like, yeah, okay, breathing, deep breathing. People always say counselors always teach deep breathing, you know, and so you get annoyed with us. But we love it because there's really intentionality with it. And so we call it four, seven, eight, because what you really need to be doing is breathing in for four counts, holding it for like seven or five or four, whatever you can do without hyperventilating, right? So hold it for seven and you exhale for eight. The important thing is it doesn't matter if it's four, seven, eight, three, four, five. You just need to exhale longer than you inhale, okay? That is called deep breathing. You take that deep breath in, you hold it, and you exhale it long. Now here's what happens. This is so cool how God designed us. When we're tense and we have those emotions, our shoulders are up here anyway, aren't they? When you take a deep breath and you exhale deeply, it pushes your shoulders down. And the farther they are from your amygdala, the calmer you feel. How cool is that? So you push that air down, and it pushes to the base of your lungs. At the base of your lungs, there are calming nerve endings that send a signal to your brain to chill out. How cool is it that God created us that way? Our creator's amazing, right? So he said, breathe. Breathe. Let my breath be in you, right? Exhale deeply so that your shoulders drop, so that you push the air to the calming nerve endings, and that can truly help. So do that five times in a row is huge. Muscle relaxation. So again, when we have those waves hit us, we get tense because we're ready to fight or flee the situation, right? Our body's getting ready to do something. And so we need to take back control and be like, okay, body, you need to chill out. And so you make yourself more tense, and you hold it, and you start at your head, and you relax the muscles all the way down to your toes. And you can do that a couple times. And when, as you're relaxing the muscles, your amygdala goes, oh, we're not tense. I guess we're okay. I guess we can chill out. Isn't that cool? Just that muscle relaxation can help so much. And then movement. Some of you, when you're stressed or have grief or these emotions welling up in you, you feel it in your hands and you need to move or your legs shake a lot, right, or something like that. And you may need movement. That might be what you need to do most. So you may need to get going on a walk, do some push-ups, ride a bike, go for a run, um, do something to get your body moving. Dance. Do that too. David did that, right? Like that, Maybe he was stressed and felt better. <laughs> I don't know. But you can do something like that to release all of that tension in you. Now, mindfulness. How many of you 
eat lunch, and you just work right through your lunch. I mean, you're working, you're eating, you just can't keep going, right? You know that's not great. It's not our best move. Mindfulness is using our five senses to actually pay attention to what we're doing, right? To notice what we're doing. So this might be, let's say in the afternoon, you get a cup of coffee or hot chocolate or tea. Instead of barely noticing it and working through it, it would mean you stop, you pay attention to the smell, to the warmth, to the temperature, what it feels like going down, and you don't do anything else till it's gone. Like, you just key into that, and that can absolutely de-escalate because you're using your five senses, and your brain is interpreting all that's going on, and it's diverting your attention away from what you felt was stressful. Stretching. Okay, we live in this box right here, right? We text here, we type here, we play video games here, right? We do all this stuff right, right here. And do you know there's a world here and here? Did y'all know this? I mean, wow, that is a profound thing, right? God made you with arms that stretch. And if we forget this, right? And so what's really, really helpful, um, when you are feeling those waves come in, especially if you're feeling really uncertain and you're feeling the, that anxiety and just it, it, what happens when we feel that is we tend to close in. And when we close in, our brain, your amygdala interprets that as, oh dear, they're going into protective stance. Something must be really wrong. But if you were to stretch and open up your arms and put your hands on your hips and do more open posture, they have done tons of research on this, that that actually tells your brain, no, we're good, we're confident, we're okay. Isn't that cool? Just by stretching, using the muscles and the arms God gave us. How many of you have pets? Perfect. So if you have pets, pets are a great way to keep you in the present. Do you realize this? Pets do not live in the future. They don't live thinking about the past. They're like right here, right now, right? And they keep you present. And so engaging with a pet, taking them for a walk. If you need to de-stress from your day, then you get home and you take your pet for a walk or you spend some time with them. Um, Being in the present, that's really helpful. Being curious about your thoughts or doing check-ins. In our office, we call this having an out-of-brain experience, okay? So what happens is when you're having these negative thoughts well up in you, it's instead of just letting them have free reign, you step back and you look in and you say, all right, brain, why are we having this thought? Why is this happening right now? Why do you think now's a good time to tell me this thought, right? Why, are, why do we have to engage this thought? And you're just talking to it. And you're, you're doing a check-in. Another check-in is to just go to somebody and say, my husband and I do this for each other all the time, where I'll say, honey, I'm stuck on a thought. I, just, I, can't, I keep getting this thought. And I'll tell him, and he'll say, is that true? Well, no, no, it's not entirely true. <laughs> you know, and we, we, we work through that together. And I do that for him. What a great gift to do a check-in and just have somebody help you. And then getting outside. I know it's winter. I know it's cold. But if you will get outside, that can absolutely help you feel better emotionally because it takes in all your senses. It's God's gift to us. He created it. You might see him more clearly if you can get inside. In all of these things, you have to be intentional. You have to choose to do these things to manage things well. So as you were listening, I hope you were able to find at least three that you could write down. And I hope you jotted those down. If not, you can think on those later. So the next thing I want to touch base with you on real quick is what it takes to have well-being. So in well-being in life, I found this in Psychology Tools, and I love this. It says for well-being, we need to have pleasure, productivity, and connection. Now think about this. Our creator evidences these things. He is productive and creative. He delights in us. His word says he delights in you. He has pleasure in you. And he desires connection with us. And if these three things are true of our creator, we are made in his image, which means we need these things too. And which three things were taken away when everything shut down? Pleasure, productivity, and connection. No wonder we were not doing so well, right? But we can be intentional about integrating these things in our life. We need a healthy balance of these things in our life. So I want you to think for a second. What is one thing that you just love to do? You just truly enjoy doing it. It's just fun. And you can do it right now. See if you can write that down. What is just one thing you love to do? In addition to that, What's one thing you feel so productive when you do it? Now, this, this could be outside of work. This might be when the dishes are not in the sink at night, I am productive. 
right? Maybe for some of you, when my car is clean for two seconds before I hit the snow, I'm productive, right? For some of you, it might be when I finish a puzzle, I finish a book, like those things, I feel so productive in that moment. What is your thing? What is the thing that you have control over that you can do that you feel productive? And next, who are your three people? Who are your connectors? Who are the ones that you connect with and you're willing to do that almost daily? Because sometimes when we don't know what else to do, the best thing you can do is to talk to somebody, right? To get talking out here with somebody, connecting with someone. You were made to, for connection. You are made for relationship. Who are your three people and how will you connect with them daily? See if you can jot those people down. All right, we're going to talk real quick about gratefulness, all right? Now, what does gratefulness do for us? It does three things. It enhances our resilience, which is our ability to get back up again. It decreases our stress, and it increases our overall health. How incredible is this? They've done tons of research. Tons of research has been done. And it's so cool because the research is backing up God's word. From, from way back when scripture was written, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, Give thanks in all things, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God said, I already know how I created you. I know that if you will give thanks in all things, not for them, but in them, I know this will be best for you. And research is like, yeah, he's right. He's right, because he made you that way. If you were intentionally be grateful and look for things to be grateful for, what happens in your brain? Well, it engages your prefrontal cortex because you're thinking and you're acknowledging and you're looking around and you're paying attention to what is happening. And God already said, this is my will for you. If you don't know what his will is, this is one of them, right? It's to give thanks. It's to give thanks in the midst of a pandemic, not for it, but in it. Right? And so there's two, two ways I would, I would maybe challenge you to do this. One is through a 30-day grateful challenge. If you were to take 30 days and write down three things you're grateful for each day for 30 days, it will increase your level of optimism. Um, and their studies show that it can increase it for about six months. Isn't that amazing? Just doing that, three, three things each day. Now, out in the uh, lobby... There's a table, a cornerstone table, and it has this grateful challenge. We've already created it for you. If you want to take that with you, you can do that. Or you can download it on our website, cornerstoneofhopelima.org, um, under the resources section if you need that. Another way to do this is to use gratitude letters or gratitude notes. Have you ever just needed a break from yourself during this time? Yeah. Sometimes. So the best way to do that is to actually send an email, um, type a text, um, do an old-fashioned note to somebody else, letting them know what you appreciate in them. Because what's happening? You're engaging your prefrontal cortex. You are connecting with somebody else. They are connecting with you. They, in turn, feel great. You feel better because they feel better. Right? Like, it's an incredible thing that God has given us, this tool of gratefulness to use during this time. All right, so I, I put on here to ask you, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you sit with that, but what are your three things? What are three things that even just today, just sitting here right now, you can say, I can be grateful for those three things. Even during this pandemic, I can see gratefulness coming to the surface, and I can be glad during this time. While you're writing that down, we're going to go on to the last kind of topic here that we want to talk about before we wrap up today, and that's the topic of resilience. Now, resilience is the ability to get back up again when things are difficult, right? When things are challenging, it's the ability, how do I get back up again? And so we, um, we want to talk about how can we be resilient. And I, I want to tell you this, this phrase here I love. It's confirmation bias. Have you all ever heard of confirmation bias? So let me tell you what can happen with this. If you wake up um, tomorrow morning, and we're still in a pandemic, and you, your thought is, this is the worst time of my life. Guess what your thoughts will be the rest of the day? Evidence on how this is the worst time in your life. You will find confirmation of your bias, your thoughts, that this is the worst time. If you wake up and say, this is the most stressful um, situation, it's never going to get better. Well, guess what you're going to look for that day? 
all the evidence that this isn't getting better, right? You're going to find evidence to back up your thought. That's confirmation bias. But if you can change it and to have a resilient perspective that says something like, today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how God's faithful today. You wake up with that mindset, what are you going to look for? Evidence that he's faithful. And you will see it, and it will confirm that. If you wake up and say, to, I was created to do hard things, and in the name of Jesus, I'm going to get through this day. Guess what you're going to look for? The ways he's helping you get through this day. You get to choose your perspective, your resilient perspective, and you will find the things that prove that true. And that's something so beautiful as the body of Christ, we get to choose this. Isn't that wonderful? He's given us this choice. Now, I want to read to you a passage of Scripture. It's on the bottom of your sheet. It's, it's David. So we're going to, you know, dive into David here a second. Um, and it's, it's in Acts because Paul is quoting him. But I don't know what was going on in David's life that day, but I think it could have been a pandemic. I'm not sure. But it says, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. If he knew he wouldn't be shaken, it's because he had the potential to be shaken, right? He said, I, the Lord is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. He was saying, I shifted to gratefulness. My tongue was glad. My heart rejoiced, even though I could have been shaken. He shifted his perspective and he said, my flesh will live in hope. Flesh means right here, right now, this side of heaven. It doesn't mean we push pause on life and wait till heaven. It means right now our flesh can live in hope based on the resilient perspective we choose. And people ask me all the time, what's hope? And I tell them, I think hope is a new perspective on our situation. I think God evidences that all through scripture. All through my life it's been he changes the way I think about it. And I have hope again. And that is how he develops that in us. So if you were to think, what is one resilient perspective you'll choose during this time? What would it be? What would it be for you? What are you going to wake up and say, that's the evidence I'm looking for now? Not what the world's looking for. Not the negative. What are you looking for? Maybe do some thinking on that and write that down. As we close, um, I, I, I live with all men in my house, okay? I have a husband, two boys. So I'm caught up on Marvel. So I don't know how many of you have ever seen Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yes, okay, all right. If you haven't, whew, it is something, all right? So there's something I love in this, in this movie, though. And Miles Morales is a new Spider-Man. He got bit by a radioactive spider, because that happens. And, you know, he's turning into Spider-Man. <clears throat> and apparently the, their big enemy is Kingpin. And somehow the Kingpin has developed something that's caused all these dimensions of different worlds to combine together. And so they're all, they're, they all, like, ended up in Miles' dimension. So all these other spider people from other dimensions are in his And they are trying to train him how to be Spider-Man. And so they're like, can you do this? And 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 they're challenging him and teaching him how to be Spider-Man. And then Gwen Stacy speaks up and she says, but above all, no matter how many times you get hit, can you get back up? And they said, that's the mark of a superhero. Is no matter how many times you get hit, can you get back up? And I love that question because it's a question of resiliency. Now, later in this movie, you see Miles, and he is battling Kingpin, and he is getting knocked down hard, almost to the point that he can't, he does not look like he's going to get back up again. And you see, off in the distance, you see Miles' dad. Now, his dad does not know that his son is Spider-Man. All he knows is Spider-Man is trying to bring hope back to their community. And you see his dad in the distance, and you hear his dad whisper these words. He says, come on, Spider-Man. Come on, please get back up again. Please get back up. And when I see that, I cannot help but imagine our Heavenly Father saying to us in the midst of a pandemic, come on, children, get back up again. Please get back up again. Because the people in your world need to see you get back up. They need to see you use the skills and the tools that God has equipped you with to say, we have hope. We have a new perspective. We will get through this because he said when, and he will equip us to get through this. That is what our world needs to see. That is how they will have hope. That is how we live in hope during this time. This is not time to push pause on life and stop until it's over. It's time to live 
It's time to live in the skills he's given us. My son asked me when early in this whole pandemic, he said, Mom, are we making history? I was like, yeah, but you are. You're making history, and your kids and your grandkids, they're going to read about this someday. You know, and he thought that was kind of cool. But I loved his question. Are we making history? Yeah, we are. What kind of history do we as the people of God, what are we going to make? What type of history will we make? So as we, dis- as we close today, and I'll let you <laughs> dismiss everyone here, but um, I want you to think about that. Go in hope. Have a new perspective. Live with resilience. The ability to get back up again and make history and make it well. Can I pray for you? Father, I thank you for these people, my brothers and sisters and you. Father, this is not easy, what we're walking through, but you didn't say it would be. But you said when we do it, you will be with us and we do not have to be afraid. Father, thank you for hope. Thank you for the skills you've given us. Would we pick them up and use them well and show those we live with, those we serve with, those we do work with, those in our communities, what it means to know a God who is not intimidated by this, but who will get us through this. Lord, we give you praise in your name. Amen.